Okay, good. Excellent. So, hello and welcome here to the next uh, session in the main hall of the DEPCONF Taiwan 2018. I'm now here with uh, Professor Dr. Wolfgang Maurer um, from Germany, Regensburg, which is a city in the south of Germany. And um, you're working with the University of Regensburg, but also with uh, the Siemens Corporation. And I just learned that Siemens actually has already an open source competence center for more than 10 years. So this is pretty cool. And uh, of course, you have a lot of products like uh, with uh, Linux and embedded Linux, and, and that's your personal background. Um, today, you will also like, um, uh, like give us more information here about um, your, the research that you are doing and uh, especially analyze Debian. So the title of the talk is, Are Any Big Brothers Watching You? And if yes, what can they tell about Debian? Of course, we want to know that. So, big round of applause for uh, Professor Dr. Wolfgang Maurer. Yeah, thank you very much um, for the introduction. Actually, that's, I think, the longest title I've ever given to a talk that I submitted somewhere. And uh, are any big brothers watching you? The answer is, of course, yes, because if not, then uh, the second second uh, question wouldn't have made any sense. As you already said, I'm kind of a split personality, so I uh, do work in academia uh, with some fraction of my time, but I'm also involved with Siemens corporate research, and yes, we're doing lots of, lots of projects based on Linux. We've had an open source competence center for more than 10 years. It goes even further back than I've been working for Siemens, and many, quite, quite many Siemens products actually use uh, Linux in its various forms. So, for instance, we own oh, that's bad angle for the laser points, I realize. Uh, for instance, the uh, leftmost device is a magnetic resonance imaging tomograph that uh, runs um, a special combination of Linux plus a real-time operating system, Xenomai, uh, if that rings a bell for you. Then we have a device that does uh, communication. Uh, sorry, the, the next device doesn't do communication. It's a, um, it's a semantic, it's an industrial controller. Then comes a mobile X-ray device, again running in Linux. Then comes uh, one of our communication platform. And the last image is supposed to represent the research, the more fundamental research that we're doing at Siemens Corporate Technology. Um, I've also done a fair share of uh, documenting and writing about the Linux kernel, some uh, even in languages that I cannot even read, so I've learned uh, that it does seem to make sense what's on the uh, last two images in the uh, bottom row, but personally, I cannot judge that. That's me on the cover, um, 10 years, oh, sorry, younger, taken by a professional photographer and photoshopped. <laughs> but it's, it's really me, so I was, I was involved in producing this picture. <laughs> Now, um, why, why am I here speaking here at DEPCONF? It's actually my first, my first time addressing uh, you guys at DEPCONF, so typically more found on the Linux Foundation events, embedded Linux conference, and so on. But part of that, uh, or a re part of the reason is that as Siemens, we are sponsoring this year's DEPCONF because of our involvement in the civil infrastructure platform, and the civil infrastructure platform is also part of the reason why I'm telling you about the stuff that I'm about to tell. Um, coming to Debian, so coming here, I was, I was uh, wondering when actually did I start using Debian first? I've never been a Debian developer. I've only been involved with Debian as a user, but that goes back for quite a while. And I, am, I do remember one of the questions that I thought about, should I be using Debian or Yggdrasil? Uh, back then in time, Yggdrasil won because it came on a CD-ROM while I had to install Debian from three and a half inch floppies, which meant carrying such a stack of floppies home. But actually I've run a Debian on quite a few architectures, x86, ARM, Spark, Power PC, you name it, Alpha, Itanium, PA Risk. When I first compiled the list, I got a bit depressed because I realized how many architectures that I've run Debian on are not even available on the market anymore. And that, I guess, just means one is getting old. C'est la vie. Um, anyway, before I start uh, discussing about what I wanted to discuss, I'd like to know a little bit more about user. Here's three target audience check questions. Who of you has done academic software engineering research lately or is an academic? OK, 
Okay, that's kind of a minority. Who of you has read about software engineering research lately? Okay, that's a few more, but also not too many. And who of you has attended a software engineering conference? Any of the names lately? An academic software engineering conference, I would say. Okay, also if you, which is which is pretty good because I feel um, when I when I talk to people, when I talk to researchers, when I talk to developers, there's a, a certain disconnect there, of course, between between research and between the people who do the actual software. There are, of course, uh, certain exceptions to these rules. So one is uh, sitting right here doing research, presenting research on Debian conferences, but as I've seen from my quick survey, that's obviously not the case too often. So it may make sense to uh, discuss this topic, and what I wanted to discuss today is how research, what kind of research is done that uh, either targets Debian, that uses Debian as a uh, foundation for research, or that can have bring positive influence to Debian. So in the first part of the talk, I'm trying to sum up a little of the research by other people that has been done in the last 10 years or so that, um, that somehow relates to Debian. And then in the second and second part of the talk, I'm going to delve a little more into details of uh, one field of research that's currently becoming very productive, namely the socio-technical analysis of large-scale development um, um, undertakings. Number three is then, I'll see if I have time for that, is more meant as an, an interactive part of the session because I also have some questions for you, some more questions, and would like to know your opinion on certain things. So what's going on in software engineering research currently? So as a, as a big fat disclaimer up front, uh, of course the software engineering uh, community is um, it having as, as easy to find a common opinion as all the Linux developers um, have it to find a distribution that suits everyone. So what I'm saying is of course my personal subjective opinion, but I'm not going to prefix every sentence with that. Uh, in my personal subjective opinion, soft, uh, some current trends in software engineering research are about one, uh, migrating this field to empirical, quantitative and evidence-based um, methodologies. So we used to have a lots of opinions, a lot of guesswork uh, in earlier years of software engineering, but people are transitioning to make that quantitative uh, and really turn it back into an engineering discipline again. And there's also lots of uh, interest lately in automated software engineering and construction because we've come to realize that uh, doing software is maybe too hard for humans, so we should get all the help from computers we need, we can get. Why does it make sense as scientists to um, investigate Debian, to do research on Debian? Of course, uh, I don't need to tell you that. Uh, it's one of the uh, largest collective engineering undertakings of mankind, which makes it interesting in itself. But the main advantage from the scientific point of view is that there's a lot of publicly accessible data behind that. So you have mailing lists, you have bug trackers, you have all kinds of um, freely accessible data sources that simply do not exist in commercial projects of a similar magnitude and that can be analyzed with uh, various methods. And that can then help science to understand the really important questions of software engineering quantitatively. How should we do development? How should integration happen? How do processes work optimally in software development and so on? As for the civil infrastructure platform, I've already mentioned that, and as for, for Siemens, for other companies, there's one solid reason why soft research about software engineering and about these more softer aspects of software engineering, like processes and methodologies, is becoming more important. And that's because, um, I've said in the beginning, Linux is used in very many non-traditional products, so your average uh, nuclear magnetic resonance machine is quite different from your laptop. Trust me, if things go wrong in this machine, it's also quite different from uh, your mobile phone rebooting and so on. These are systems that need to satisfy very strict safety requirements. On the other hand, uh, they, need to, so they need to provide more and more functionality. And that means uh, people are really getting into using Linux in these very demanding safety critical fields, which has its dangers and which requires a certifying software that comes from the Linux domain that has not been written with safety in mind. Um, actually, there's, there's three, three different uh, ways to get software uh, safety certified. So that one is 
start from scratch, start development from zero, do standard compliant development. That's obviously out of the question for Linux, and so no one wants to start the Linux kernel again. Uh, but you can also argue with proven in use arguments. You could say, hey, I've been using Debian on my Spark station for the last 25 years and no single fault ever happened, so let's do it. Let's um, put it on a magnetic resonance tomography machine, of course, simplifying things. And you could also do compliant, so called compliant, non compliant development, which necessitates you to prove certain aspects of the development processes. And of course, that's only possible if you analyze processes, if you can make quantitative statements about the processes. And that's the general goal of, um, of, uh, of analyzing the software elements of software engineering. I've already mentioned the civil infrastructure platform. That's one of the reasons um, why, why I'm uh, interested in this kind of research. The civil infrastructure platform, you may have seen our booth, uh, you know that we are sponsoring the conference. The civil infrastructure platform is dedicated at bringing Linux into such areas, not so much from the safety point of view as of now, but from the super long-term maintainability point of view. So you may replace your mobile phone every year, or every two years, maybe every three years, but you certainly don't want to replace your nuclear power station every two years. You don't want to replace your uh, magnetic resonance tomography machine every two years. You don't want to replace your industrial control in your big ass um, uh, industrial plant every two years. But, so these, these devices are supposed to last for 10 years, for 20 years, even longer. And that's the um, uh, the interest of the civil, infra, uh, civil infrastructure platform initiative of the Linux Foundation to provide such system, which of course creates strong interest in many things, for instance, in long-term support of the distribution itself. So we're supporting Debian LTS, strong interest in reproducible builds for various reasons, but uh, also interest in these research topics I mentioned, namely automated software engineering and especially quantifying processes are identifying when processes work well and when they don't. So, um, coming back to analyzing Debian, of course, uh, the process analysis and related things is just one, a particular subfield that people have been working on um, by analyzing Debian. And I promised in the uh, submission of this talk to outline the research that has been done about Debian or using Debian and so on. Turns out that's pretty hard to find some objectively representative examples. I already mentioned this problem. It's always hard to talk about other people's work and I'm trying in this first part to focus on other people's work and that's, that's hard for two reasons. First, because a lot of software engineering research is published each year. Hundreds of papers is maybe totally underestimating the amounts. People often use Debian but don't mention it explicitly when they analyze Debian is typically mentioned, but still any choice um, I would make is subjective and unfair. So I decided to go with a more, uh, perhaps more objective and fair methods, go to Web of Science, that's a, a science database, search for the keyword Debian, then select the papers I get and then maybe select um, work that cites with or, or work that builds on this. Of course, that still uh, gives a, a very subjective and unfair choice, but at least superficially I can claim that I have made efforts to do this objectively. As a result, I'm uh, going to first talk about a number of papers, about 30, um, 30 of them. Of course, apologies for not being able to covering them in detail. That's uh, quite impossible in a one hour session, but I'll try um, I'll try to, to, um, to cover them as good as possible. For the next slide, I already apologize in advance, so I thought, a lo uh, sorry, no, for that one I don't apologize yet, I'm going to apologize for the next one. These uh, 33 papers I've classified into broadly five categories where people are interested in dealing with Debian, that's of course improving software quality, that's the foremost goal of software engineering in analyzing communities and cooperation. So here we're getting into a more non-standard topic, testing and analyzing code at large scale, which is again um, a fairly obvious thing to do, understanding licensing and code sharing. Of course, that relates very much to open source software. That's also very much or very close to the heart of many Debian developers. And then finally, as the last category, research that um, focuses at uh, improving Debian itself. So now that's the slide I'm apologizing for and also for the uh, four other ones. I really tried to make, uh, uh, to, to present uh, the, um, the, 
the papers that I was mentioning in, uh, in a more uh, graphical or entertaining way, but turns out it's simply not possible. So um, I'm just listing the authors approximately the time when the research appeared and what it was about, and we'll comment a little bit so that you get an impression what people are actually trying to do with the help of Debian. And uh, one of the first, um, one of the first uh, papers that was, of the earlier papers, that was dealing with uh, improving software quality in general with the help of Debian was by Chan and Wagner in 2007. A uh, large-scale analysis of format, str format string vulnerabilities in Debian Linux. That's, of course, a, a very interesting goal for every software developer, especially if you're dealing with C and C++. What they came up with is they could analyze a very good fraction of all C packages in Debian, so they used Debian as a data source to get their hands on as much C code as they could. They analyzed about 66% or roughly 70% of all the C files in the Debian distribution. Back then, that was Debian 3.1. And found a whopping 1,500 string vulnerabilities that could be possibly exploited. Okay, they estimated that about uh, eight, only 85% of them are true positives, but still that's, that's a quite scary number. And they also managed to get rid of quite, quite a few of them in the course of this, of this research. So that is um, quite an impressive work. Um, moving forward a little uh, more to the present, Adams and uh, friends, especially the name uh, German, or Daniel German, we will hear quite often on this list, um, was research published about an empirical study of integration activities and distribution of open source software. And that distribution of open source software, one of them is, of course, Debian. So they were able to find uh, some, some patterns that package, or they were able to identi identify some, um, some integration patterns that people actively use in everyday development. And the nice thing about that is they really did uh, not just do a theoretical analysis, but talk to the actual maintainers, talk to some actual maintainers in Debian to confirm or refute uh, their findings and then um, yeah, basically documented these for everyone to benefit from the wisdom that comes from Debian. Uh, the next paper, source file set search for clone and reuse analysis. That's a typical example of research that builds on the large data sources provided by Debian. Of course, developers do like to copy and paste on occasion, but it's, the question is how often does that happen? How does that influence source code quality or does that influence uh, software quality? And they came up with an academic method um, to, to evaluate these questions or to find uh, source code duplicates uh, in the Debian ecosystems and then at least roughly quantify um, the, the magnitude, how often that happens. Good, and finally, um, the last paper, the depth sources data set, that should surely ring a bell with many of you because uh, one of the authors used to be a Debian project lead that turns out to be a, a quite recurring pattern. So many Debian projects leads tend to publish academic work. So in that respect, there is already quite some connection between, uh, between Debian and the scientific world, at least when it comes to the leaders. And this data set, I guess you've all have heard of, maybe you're all using it, it comes from academic research, but builds up a, more, a faithful representation of all the data that they can get their hands on. And by sharing it, they're enabling uh, a, a huge amount of data for other researchers that can be analyzed and that can be used to, uh, to benefit from Debian. So communities and cooperation, that's a, a quite different topic that's not really, or that has traditionally not been so much in the focus of the uh, core computer science research of uh, core software engineering. And again, uh, the first papers I'd like to mention come from one of the uh, previous Debian project leaders. The first one, uh, I think, no, I spelled his name right, I think, so he lacks some vowels. Um, and that, that was one of the early studies, um, one of the early studies on how people actually cooperate in software projects, in large distributed software projects. Back in 2003, doing uh, something like Debian, a volunteer-based, um, building a volunteer-based large system was too much of industry. A bit of a shock because they were only used to these uh, traditional top-down uh, hierarchically organized um, 
development undertakings. And what these authors did was no, no, not yet um, formalizing or make, um, making quantitative statements, but really capturing um, the essence of the Debian development process and the Debian approaches uh, that, they, that have been found useful so far, led to a number of um, um, subsequent papers that I'd not like to discuss in detail. What's interesting is that a couple of years later, the knowledge that uh, there are actually alternatives to traditional management style even spread uh, to the outside the engineering domains, like uh, the second paper from the Information of and uh, Economics Policy Journal is quite not related to computer science, but they also used um, insights from the Debian distribution to teach different management styles than the traditional ones to the world. Um, yeah, the paper by Wang, that's an example of a long, um, of a large amount of papers that um, started to look at the problem of how people cooperate, how communities are formed, and so on more quantitatively. Uh, the, the subject that uh, Wang's considering is a very special one, so they're looking at um, email archives from Debian and then try to infer if someone writes an email to any of the mailing lists, how likely is it to get responses, how likely is uh, this or that developer to respond, and so on. And it turns out you can do that pretty reliably with um, machine learning and statistical techniques. Okay, question of course is, what's this good for? But that's not really <laughs> the, um, the essence of research. It's already um, amazing that you can tackle such problems, such very social problems in a quantitative manner. And the last uh, couple, of, um, couple of papers, the last three papers are a, a very good example of the Debian community being made the guinea pig of actual research, maybe with knowing, maybe without knowing. So many of you perhaps have uh, participated in any of the key signing events uh, at Debian conferences, and then you surely have heard the name Wolf. If you didn't know that you've contributed to actual academic research by um, doing proper key management in your function within Debian, then uh, these are the papers that you may want to look at. Testing and analyzing code. That's again at large scale, I should mention, because testing, uh, testing, uh, testing small code is of course not so much of an issue. Testing 50,000 50, packages uh, produced by thousands and thousands of developers is a completely different matter. That's uh, the subject of the next category. And um, so the first paper I'd like to mention is, seems like a very straightforward one. So on the distribution of source code file sizes, uh, done in 2011 by Harais and uh, friends. But that actually, and that of course also was, uh, this study of course was performed on the Debian distribution because it contains very many files, so it seems like a good place to go for if you want to measure file size distribution. And what they surprisingly came up with is that many of the previous assumptions on how file sizes are distributed in large projects are essentially wrong, so they need to be described by different, dis different distributions. But if this, ins if this is wrong, if people have been using wrong estimates, for that previously, that means that many of the models that we use to uh, compute the value of software, the economic value of software, make predictions on build time, make predictions on bugs and so on, are essentially flawed. Good, going on, mining security vulnerabilities from Linux distribution metadata. Uh, that's a, a work that goes yeah, into the, um, more into the testing, uh, testing portion of this uh, category. And what the authors did is they were they um, basically they were interesting they were interested in um, how do how do security vulnerabilities within Debian evolve? They are of course getting fixed uh, as far as that's possible, but how do they uh, track across releases? How long does it take? Um, are we getting better at that or not? And they only could do that because there's all this historical data available in the bug trackers in the open forums. That's again an example for research that's simply not possible if you don't have open data sets, if you only rely on um, proprietary um, and company endemic code. The next paper by Krönig and Taunschnik, the research done in 2015, is in my opinion 
particular uh, very, very interesting because it raised one problem that's known to many developers in the real world, but that's not known, uh, that's, that's not known to, many, to many researchers in the academic world. Because what they did in this paper is actually very simple. They took some existing, uh, they took some existing research tools and tried to ap apply them to the Debian universe. Of course, uh, the result is that the research tool broke in most of the cases because it's uh, typically optimized for some very special cases. It's not optimized for all the uh, bells and whistles you find in real life source code. It's not optimized for the volume of data you're dealing that. But this paper turned out to be quite a win-win situation for both uh, research and Debian because on the one hand, by applying the tools to Debian, they managed to improve their tools, managed to fix bugs in their tools, uh, fix corner cases and so on, but they also contributed uh, lots of bug reports back to Debian 700 in this case. And in case if uh, any one of you would have been bored before 2015, then uh, we should have had lots to do after this paper and this work was done. Good, in the last paper, let me just briefly skip over that. That's a classical example of applying testing approaches uh, to large, large uh, collections of um, software. So in this paper, the authors could prove very specific properties, dead, um, deadlock freedom uh, for C programs in an impressive amount of cases, 292. So the community, I guess, doesn't learn too much from that immediately, but it's at least uh, reassuring to hear that it's impossible to detect many common bugs in your software repositories. Good, moving on uh, to licensing and code sharing, a topic that's obviously very, very specific to, um, to open source software. And uh, I guess I'm progressing further in time than I would like anyways. I'm going to just quickly summarize what uh, people did here without getting into the details, but it's basically, it's, um, it's two, two types of approaches that people are doing. One is, Using, um, using, um, using source code analysis to detect any incompatibilities uh, in the licenses that are combined in Debian packages or in the distribution at large. So finding basically uh, spots where, changes, where legal changes are needed to make um, the sharing of, the, to make sharing of uh, source code um, legally okay again to, to comply with the open source licenses. And um, Another, another aspect of this that I'd like to mention is that Debian still can, set, uh, uh, can, can bring surprising, surprising input to other fields of science. Uh, if you look at the third paper from top, the 2013 paper, that's actually from physicists. So I'm, uh, I'm a physicist by, by education, so I can fully understand the problem, of course, in physics. And that's a, a quote from a, a physics conference that I'm giving now when it comes to software, everyone thinks they're Moses. So a physicist, of course, would never listen to any computer scientist on how to write their software, how to package the software and so on. And that's why it was possible in 2013, uh, 2014, to come up with a paper that basically said, yeah, so we're packaging software. Astonishingly, there have been people who have done that before, and maybe we shouldn't do this our own way, but use the same tools, formats, and so on that Debian uses. So if you're in physics, you can invent a Linux distribution or reinvent the Linux distribution in 2014 and still get that published. But that's, again, one of the uh, nice effects that distributions like Debian has. And finally, coming to my to the last category, research about improving Debian as such. Mm. Here I'd like to highlight um, especially yeah, two approaches. So one again, the first one is again from one of the former Debian projects leaders. So we've had three or four of them already. And um, what he did was actually superficially a very simple task that usually wouldn't be regarded by science as as interesting if you don't care for the details. If you start caring for the details, you of course realize that this task is very hard. And the task was to rebuild Debian as quickly as possible, rebuild the whole Debian distribution as quickly as possible. In 2009, if I recall correctly, there was about 10, 12 or so thousand packages, already quite a lot. 
And it took about a week to build the whole system, which is naturally bad if you want to do automated testing, if you want to test uh, reproducible builds, if you want to roll out releases and so on. And the goal of this paper was a really practical one, namely use one of the largest uh, French distributed computers, the GRID 5000 machine, to rebuild Debian. The paper itself is very interesting because uh, there's so many so many problems that you wouldn't expect that range from uh, packages not being able to build in parallel to vastly different, uh, differing, different, boots, uh, different builds, times, and so on, that a lot can be learned from that work. And that's also a very nice example of research that directly benefits Debian because he could, uh, by using these large resources, large shared resources that are now these days standard, if you think of cloud computing, he could really bring down the build time of Debian from weeks to Roughly, uh, I think it was eight eight hours or so, so a very, very small amount of time. Um, the other papers um, basically are uh, um, are doing applying research on Debian and then in some way or another contributing it back. So to not spend too much time on that anymore, I just invite you to to look at these papers. The links links are all in the PDFs that I will be distributing. But it's uh, they are all very good examples for doing, uh, doing uh, interesting research based on Debian and immediately feeding back improvements to Debian itself. So, as I said, I did, ap I did already apologize for uh, listing five pages of references, but I really couldn't find any better way uh, to introduce at least some, um, some representative sample of research about Debian. So let me, let me come to the second part that will be more pictorial which is uh, the socio-technical analysis part, which is due to the fact that um, I'm going now in a shameless plug to focus a little bit on my own research that I did, so it's not so much about the actual papers. Of course, lots of people have contributed to that research field, and I don't want to, to outline my, my own research too much, but I'd rather like to um, discuss the fact that actually many of the problems or software development, to a large extent, can be reduced to two problems, mostly. And I guess many of you know these two problems. Problem number one is, it's about technology. The so software is about technology, and technology is hard. Uh, this is a pictorial representation of the Tower of Babel. Uh, you may be more likely to be to be aware of that if you come from a European background, so for those with a non-European background, that was a, an attempt by people in the early ages to build a tower that reaches up to the heaven, that reaches up to God. Uh, very massive engineering undertaking, and of course that failed tower broke down, people spread all across the world, spoke different languages, and so on. People in Taiwan, if I think of the Taipei 101, of course do better these days, but still it's quite a way to go up to the sky and to heaven. So problem number one, software is about technology. Problem number two, software is about people. And uh, this image, I guess, even less of you are supposed to know. It's a very famous uh, black and white movie in Germany, basically about uh, two people, one Catholic priest and the leader of a socialist party in post-war Italy that want exactly the same thing for the people to be happy, to be nice to each other but totally cannot agree on how to achieve these goals. I'm, I'm pretty sure you've never heard of this problem in Debian. You want the same thing, but there's multiple ways to reach the thing, and then you discuss uh, ad infinitum to reach it. So second problem, it's about people. And that's where the, um, where the, um, the research field of, so here we are, where the research field of socio-technical analysis comes from. The idea is to combine knowledge about both aspects, the social aspects and the technical aspects of software development to arrive at better software development methodology. And of course, nothing is better suited than open source software to get information on the social and the technical aspects of software development because it always, it very often comes already in combined form. So social information is contained in many of the artifacts that we are creating in software development. As an example, I'm taking a, a commit to a software project, but you could find similar things in many other artifacts. Um, 
that appear when you do when you create distributions, when you do infrastructure work, and so on. The commit, as you see in the bottom part, you all you all are very familiar with commits, so I don't need to spend much time on that. The commit does not just contain the actual patch or the actual diff to the project that does the technical change, but it also contains lots of explicit and implicit social information. For instance, in Git, you have an author of a commit, you have a committer of a commit. That creates a social relation between two persons. In some projects, you have uh, these developer certificates of origin, for instance, in the Linux kernel, that tell who reviewed the patch, who acknowledged the patch, um, maybe even who was against the patch, that create an uh, effective social relation between two persons, and these social relations directly come with the technical change, the uh, change brings. So, and that's, of course, the ideal data source to come up with, to consider socio-technical aspects of, um, of development, of software development. Question is, how do we leverage these data to, collect, uh, to uh, construct collaboration networks? So which, which of the social connections I mentioned um, do we use best to come up with appropriate representations of the social structure of projects? How do we determine uh, which developers are influential, which are central to the network, and which are not? And that's not meant in the sense that uh, this should be used for finger pointing or uh, giving, giving badges to people, but just in the sense of how stable our development networks works, how well structured are they, and so on. And how do we identify communities? How can we arrive at uh, conclusions if, these, if the community structures we find are good and bad for software development? So constructing these networks is a topic of its own. I'm, uh, going to, I'm not going to discuss any of these methods in detail, just um, observe that there's a lot of different possibilities to construct these networks, both for uh, relations between people as well as relations between software development artifacts. So of course, not only people, but also uh, artifacts are in some kind of relation with uh, one another. Detecting communities, uh, analyzing network properties, and so on. Uh, that's also quite a standard problem of science and actually um, and when, when I did this first, most surprisingly to me is that sociolo sociology, there is uh, quite some mathematical aspects to sociology and they really came up with many approaches to find communities, to quantify these networks, to uh, assign properties to these networks and so on. That uh, can be readily used in the socio-technical analysis of software development. Uh, yeah, so here's, here's an example if you just take the data that you have and try to find a collaboration network that, for instance, is for the Linux kernel, that, of course, is um, maybe not the most easiest one to interpret, so you need to uh, bring that down to you need to bring that down to more uh, digestible form to, to form that can be better comprehended. And that, of course, involves finding communities, finding sub-communities in this large network of people. Unfortunately, I don't have a a picture ready for, for the Debian community could be easily created, but essentially it would look very much the same as, wet, as that, so no information, you need to boil it down to, uh, to easier to uh, digest units. And that's, of course, uh, subgraphs, clusters, subcommunities in the developer network that you can find with uh, many, many existing tools. Okay. Um, just to give, you, to give you an example, just to give you a little rationale that these approaches really work, uh, I'm skipping from, no, actually, yeah, Q, QMU. Many of you may know QMU, the um, virtualization or, and simulation software, system level simulation software. That's a very nice example that you can really see how uh, the mode of cooperation, how uh, interaction between developers changes over time. So QMU 0.11, that's a very ancient version that was mostly running as a hobbyist project back then, created by Fabrice Bellar, uh, in the way he maybe usually does things, create them just out of boredom and to show that things can be done, like uh, putting a Linux kernel in a JavaScript simulator in a browser, or writing a universal system simulation software that can um, provide support for any hardware that you like, and so on. And you actually see that, so people got, got interested in that project, it's not the early phase of the project, but you see in this graph, uh, nodes represent developers, the size of node represents the relative influence of a developer to that project. That there's one developer that has a really large node that basically makes up the project with some, um, some smaller, very small nodes attached to him. So these are the contributors that give him patches, but in the end of the day, it's the 
the main developer who does the actual work. That, of course, is not a good structure if you want to rely on a project because consider the truck factor, what happens if the largest node uh, is hit by a bus, then you very likely will run into coordination, into sustainability problems. So moving on with QEMU's version history, at some point it became, uh, or QEMU became one of the core components of virtualis virtualization systems like KVM or commercial solutions, and then people really started caring about what will happen to the project if things go wrong. And um, so the development structure changed. QEMU 0.13 uh, had, um, yeah, um, a more apt structure already, and with QEMU 1.5.0, that's still an old version from today's standard, but that's at the uh, height of the whole cloud and virtualization uh, time. Just a second. You see that this QEMU, uh, that QEMU really evolved into a, an org a social collaboration structure that uh, every textbook manager would really like. So you have people who are responsible in each sub-community. It's a manageable number of sub-communities. The communities are large, but still not infinite and so on. So um, what we do actually actually does make sense and can be, can be, objectively, uh, can be objectified. So you have a uh, question? Sorry, I'm trying to make sense of this uh, graph uh, mm -hmm. visualization. So uh, is the connections and arrows representing something of the node relation of the nodes? Yes, so the nodes represent developers and the arrows represent cooperation relationships uh, for not just forget about the direction of the arrow. Uh, if there's a, a, a um, an edge between two nodes, that means these two nodes, these two developers do interact in one form or another. Uh, how do you define the interaction? So I've said there's, there's multiple ways to define interactions. For this, um, for this case, um, we're defining interaction as people who have contributed to a common software development artifact, and the artifact in this case is either a function or a class. But there's also, there's also other ways like this committer-author relationship or uh, reviewing one's patches and so on that essentially leads to the same results. No. Would you please repeat the question? Uh, would you, uh, would you, uh, so the question was, did you use uh, this and that theory that I don't know? And then the simple answer was no. <laughs> Could you repeat the, the name of the theory that you mentioned that I don't know? There is uh, Gunter und Wille. Um, they have um, published in Springer a mm -hmm. formal concept theory. You have a number of um, uh, concepts and you have a number of um, uh, properties. Mm -hmm. And then you can connect these um, together. Mm -hmm. uh, you can filter them out according to a certain algorithm mm -hmm. so that uh, you have a source and you have a, a sink. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you can split up in uh, possible good choices, mm -hmm. the best choices there are, according to a certain uh, uh, filter. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's used uh, for files and for, for many things. Uh, so uh, you can find it in, uh, mm -hmm. in Spring of Airlock. Okay, yeah, that's, that's something we should look at, but the, the short answer is we haven't used it for that work. Having read so many of these papers, what is your sense about how often the data uh, collected and analyzed in these projects is being used to support the Debian project? Um, that is a question that brings me that brings me to the to the end of the talk. So I wanted to skip a few slides anyway. So that's a good opportunity. Um, you can tell lots about the the networks that you find, about the the properties of different types of networks, what these properties mean. Um, for, for the communities, for progressing with the communities. There's also lots of work being done to ensure that these networks are accurate. So, but given all that, the question is how could the, if I understood your question correctly, how could the Debian community or other communities benefit from this kind of work? And that's, that's precisely um, one of the points why I'm, why I'm presenting this here. So I said, we will need more of this information. We will need to be able to quantify the social aspects of a project when it comes to, when it comes to 
um, safety certifying or certifying other aspects of software projects. Yeah. I would like to disagree that you do not need more data to support Debian. Mm. What you need is to support Debian. So if you have anything that can support Debian, you can use it to support Debian. You do not need more data to do that. So if these papers are providing information that helps us understand how this project should improve, it would be nice if there was an emphasis among academics that these are applied research papers, mm -hmm. they're not just basic, and that yes, there is something to learn about Debian in mm -hmm. terms of applying it elsewhere, but Debian needs that help. Okay, so I see. So basically what, what you're asking is why, why don't we give back the data to Debian to support How Debian to encourage it. I am encouraging you okay. to encourage others. Okay. Yes. So actually that's, that's um, things we're trying very actively. So firstly, let me point out that of course all the analysis that I've presented here, I had to skip over a lot of them of course, but that's all based on open source software. So um, we're publishing all our data, we're publishing all our methodologies, it's uh, on GitHub. There's no Debian package for that because this whole thing is basically unpackageable, but that's just a detail problem. The, the issue is so, and of course, um, yeah, that, that, brings me, that brings me to this point, to the BOF thing. What I would, what I would like to ask you as a, as an, at the end of the talk, as an outcome of that, as I said, I had to skip a lot of methodology, but that is to learn what the actual questions are that you think make sense to be analyzed in that way. So are there any spots where you say, okay, so we, we're unsure how to proceed best. There's uh, different approaches how we could do that. How could we get, could we get answers by, by doing this type of analysis? But there's also, there's also a, a thing that we would need from Debian for that. And uh, I said, you can, you can, um, you can argue well that the, the uh, relations you obtain from these results are correct in a certain sense, but this certain sense is only statistical. So without going into the detail, there are some statistical techniques that you can use to validate the networks that you infer. But in the end of the day, you need to really check it against the knowledge of real people. You need to, you need to validate that against the knowledge of real people to ensure that you're not just analyzing anything. Because uh, the problem we're dealing with here is you can, from any data, you can come up with arbitrary connection graphs. So you can say, and co uh, collaboration graphs. You can say, um, committed to offer is the social relation to go for. You can say, uh, analyze cooperation at the file level, that's the way to go for. You can say, uh, analyze um, evolutionary dependencies, that's the way to go for. That'll give you a graph. And then on this graph, you will run some, um, some, some, um, some clustering algorithm that will give you communities, but the problem is a clustering algorithm will always give you a community, regardless if this represents reality or not. And that's the point where we need the input of actual developers, of actual people knowledgeable of the system. Um, uh, re relating to the previous topic, I have one uh, question uh, that might be useful to us. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see you analyzed uh, several, uh, or your community has analyzed several projects uh, like uh, QMU, LLVM, mm -hmm. and, and I, I, I read you uh, analyzed some big projects, small projects, successful and failure yes. ones. Yes. So is it possible to predict like 10 years from now how Debian will look like? from the present clustering or structure, mm -hmm. will it fail or will it have been a big success or mm -hmm. will it split or something like that? Well, it, so it, the, these are of course very detailed questions so it's only um, possible to predict the future in a limited way but that's, um, that's a field that we've been considering and there, there are actually, I didn't cover that slide, there are actually some patterns that you find in successful open source projects, how they grow, how the network properties change over time. And that is uh, to a certain extent an indicator how a project will do in the future or if there are any corrections needed to the way a project is run. So for instance, LLVM, as you already mentioned, would be an example of a healthy and successful project that follows a typical pattern. Other projects like Node.js that may have slightly more trouble than uh, projects like the Linux kernel or like LLVM don't follow this pattern, yes, and that um, if you, want, if you want to predict such things, then looking at uh, these kinds of, uh, of data would be the appropriate thing to do. Of course, uh, feel free to come to me afterwards and tell me more about the specific aspects that uh, you find worthy of analysis. Okay. Hey, th 
Thanks. Um, so following on from the theme of sort of the previous questions uh, mm -hmm. about prediction and getting more data, um, so as you said yourself, um, w given any constant set of static set of data, it's possible to analyze it to whatever degree you want and mm -hmm. come up with whatever conclusions you want, like arbitrarily pick specific, um, specific properties to look at. So I think like um, asking or, or asking for more data would sort of just basically repeat that same mistake of um, coming up with whatever conclusions you want based on more and more data. So for me, sort of the scientific method really is to be able to, um, is, to is to aim for being able to make predictions or prescriptions to test the future or to try to um, adapt or mm -hmm. to um, do something different in the future. And that's really what actually um, tests whether a theory is true or not. You can't sort of test a theory, whether, you can't be sure whether a theory is true or not even if it's a very sophisticated or convincing sounding theory, unless you make predictions or unless you make prescriptions of how we can improve ourselves and, and have those predictions or prescriptions be justified in the future using yeah. unknown future data. Um, so yeah, I, I sort of, that's, I guess, echoing also the, um, is, uh, the previous opinions that uh, more data isn't necessary at this stage. It's to actually convert the existing data that we have to actions or predictions. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually, I, I don't think I was really asking for, for even more data in the sense of that we need uh, more projects, that we need more source files, that we need more communication. So what we have right now in terms of communication data, projects and so on is already very much and uh, quite sufficient for our purpose. Maybe if I said that, then I said it wrong. But what we, what we actually need is verification, verification by experts, because the, the uh, arbitrariness I was referring to comes from, say, clustering. Clustering will always produce your clusters, and you can use statistics to verify that, basically, the clustering you found is either highly improbable, so it's likely not right, or highly probable, or whatnot, again, without going into details. But the, the final, the real proof point is if you analyze people and their social interactions, is the actual people. And if they say, okay, that's about how I perceive it, then your method at least is likely to be right. Um, but then this is sort of subject to the biases that experts um, have as well. And, and I guess by experts, you mean people that mm -hmm. are sort of well embedded in the communities. Yes. Um, you know, I, I, I'm somewhat well embedded mm -hmm. in the communities. Um, so maybe I fit your definition of expert, but I, I wouldn't be confident in my own self-analysis of what reality is like. It would only be if I could make predictions or if other people could give predictions to me that I would then be confident that mm. these things okay, Of course, so I'm, I totally agree. Just uh, taking time into account, I'd like to cut this um, off Thank now, you. but um, rest assured that we have a whole lot of psychologists that take, uh, take, um, take care of exactly these questions that you raised with the very good questions. And uh, in the end of the day, let me just close with, so I hope I've sufficiently raised your interest or raised uh, you to, to, um, to disagree with me that we will come uh, tomorrow on Sunday after this talk whenever to some discussions about the topics I've shown you. But with that, thank you very much and I don't want to keep you from uh, rockets any longer.